Hi folks, and welcome to another episode of Open Analysis Live, we're back. So today we have a pretty interesting topic to cover, a little bit different from what we've been doing in the past, where we've been doing sort of reverse engineering walkthroughs. In this episode, we are going to take a look under the hood at IDA and how it creates the decompiled view that you have if you have the Hexrace plugin and you're looking at the decompiled back to C source code or C-like source code. So this is something that happens every once in a while where you might come across what looks like a bug in the decompiler and you'll have a scenario like this. So here we have the uh, decompile view on the right hand side. We have the disassembly on the left hand side and you can see that there's a lot more code in the disassembly than there is in the decompile view. In fact, it looks like there's a lot of stuff missing from the decompile view. And if we click on this function here where we do a highlight um, matching the disassembly from, to the decompile view, you can see that all this code here is all hidden. All this stuff in green, uh, it's quite a bit of stuff is hidden uh, from the decompile view. Now, this is obviously not good. Uh, you know, if you are relying only on the decompiler to reverse engineer, it would mean that you're missing all kinds of code here. And of course, this function wouldn't really make a lot of sense. Um, you know, it's missing tons of stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to investigate why this is happening. And in order to do that, we're going to have to talk about calling conventions, the intermediate language that IDA uses to represent binaries uh, in the decompiled view. So this is what they call microcode, or as we commonly know now, we call it uh, intermediate representation or uh, an intermediate language. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that and how that works under the hood. And in other episodes, we've covered techniques that I've been doing for years and years myself, I'm very comfortable with. This actually is something I'm very interested in, but I'm also learning as I go. So learning about um, intermediate representations of binaries and how to manipulate them and how it works is something that's actually new to me. Um, something that I'm learning now, very interested in um, for some of the projects that I'm working on. So uh, you'll forgive me if I make some mistakes. This is me sort of feeling my way through how it all works. Um, and I'm just kind of going to take you guys along for the journey and uh, hopefully we all learn something uh, as we go through it. So to jump in here, like I said, we have this scenario where it looks like a lot of the code from the disassembly is missing in the decompiled view. So normally when something like this happens, sort of my experience of, of seeing this sort of stuff before would tell me to look at the calling convention for these functions and see if there's a mistake there and try and fix that up. The reason for that is that a lot of the times when Ida is doing its, uh, when Ida is building its decompiled view, um, it might miss some arguments or it might miss the calling type for a function and that'll mess up the, the disassembly view. So uh, that's how I used to deal with this stuff. And as I'll show you here, this is a calling convention error, but I didn't quite understand until recently why uh, this would mess things up. I just knew that it did. And I knew that by fixing the calling conventions, you could fix the decompiled view. But today we're gonna talk about why this is happening. So the first thing to do is to talk about calling conventions. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is basically just a convention that is used in the assembly code when you call a function to pass arguments to the function. So there's a bunch of different conventions that can be used and all they do is they describe how arguments are gonna be passed to the function that's called. So you can pass arguments on the stack, you can pass them on a register, on a combination of stack and registers, and each different variation of uh, how these arguments is passed is a different uh, calling convention. So the ones that we're gonna talk about today are the ones that we see here. If we hover over our function here, we can see that it's a this call convention. And actually, if you press Y, you can edit the calling convention. So we see that it's a underscore this call. So let's pull up that calling convention and we'll discuss that for a minute here. So I pulled this up in the MSDN docs here and it tells us that this call is basically pretty standard for C++ classes. And the way that they're passing arguments is they're pushed on the stack from right to left and the this pointer, so this would be the struct for the class, is pushed into the ECX register and it's passed on, e on the ECX register, not in the stack. So uh, this is kind of similar to what you've probably seen if you took a computer science course um, and you saw arguments being passed in the stack. This is pretty much the same idea here, except that we have the class uh, struct being passed in ECX. 
So let's take a look at the disassembly code here and see if that makes sense. So here we have the call. We don't see any arguments being pushed um, onto the stack here. And we see uh, something uh, variable here being moved into ECX. And then we see um, the call here. So that kind of looks like it could be this call, but something else uh, catches my eye here. And this is where normally if I was just looking to fix this and I wasn't trying to go any deeper, I would take a look at the other arguments around the function and then see if they sort of make sense in the context of the call. So what I mean here is here's EDX and we have this variable here that's moved into EDX. Then we have a check on EDX and then that causes this jump. That means that um, there's probably something changed in this variable that we're checking, likely probably from this call. But check this out. This variable is actually loaded, so the address is loaded into EDX, but EDX isn't acted on anywhere, right? So we have this variable pushed into EDX or the address moved into EDX, so it's gonna be passed by reference. And then we have a call, but if it's a this call, there should be no EDX register being used in the call, right? There should only be the stack and ECX. So that tells me that there's something wrong here. Most likely EDX should be passed into this call, so that means the calling convention is wrong. We can double check this by checking out the call. So let's go into the call here and let's see if they use EDX. So here you see them moving the registers. They're basically storing the registers. So this is part of the prologue for the function. And you see them moving EDX into EDI, meaning that they expect something to be in the EDX register, right? So that wasn't, EDX wasn't set up previous to this call, so they expect it to be set from the caller. So that means that the um, function type is wrong. So it shouldn't be this call, it should be a different type of call. And you'll actually see Ida has helpfully fixed it for us automatically um, because we jumped into this. They did a reanalysis and realized that that EDX was actually being used. So Ida's fixed the type for us. If Ida hadn't fixed the type for us, then we'd have to find a calling convention that passes an argument in EDX so we could figure out what the calling convention is. Luckily, Ida has told us that it's fast call, or at least they think it's fast call. So let's take a look at the fast call calling convention. So here's the fast call calling convention. Again, just a different convention for passing arguments to a function. And we can see here that the first two D word or small arguments are passed in ECX and EDX. So EDX is being used. Then the rest of them are passed on the stack. So this sounds like a call for us, right? We're passing EDX as an argument. So it looks like Ida has found probably the right calling convention. So they fixed it here. And they've also added an extra argument to the call. So they now know that there is a second argument being passed here. And if we hover over it, we can see that it's being passed in the EDX register. So you can see EDX there. So what we can do now is we can go back to the function that called this function and see whether that change in the calling convention has fixed it up. So let's pop back here. Hey, look at that, right? They fixed all this code up, right? It's all fixed. And that means that this function here, that's our function, it now has the right calling convention. So it has fast call and two arguments. There we go, Ida did it for us. All we had to do was click on the function and Ida figured it out for us. That's where I used to stop. I would just be happy that it fixed it, right? Perfect. Wow, great moves, keep it up proud of you. But what I want to do today is I want to show you why this happens. Um, I think it's very interesting. And for those of you who are looking into automated binary analysis, you'll find that this is actually very interesting. So let's reload this binary. We'll reload it back to its old state so that um, the calling convention is wrong. Then I'm going to show you how Ida builds their decompiled view of the code piece by piece. And I'll show you where this mistake in the calling convention led to a cascade of mistakes in interpreting the binary. So let's reload it here. I'm reloading! Okay, so now that we're back here, see how all this code is highlighted in green? So that means that all of this matches with that decompiled view here. What I find interesting here is this jump right after the compare with EDX. So remember in this version of the decompiled code, EDX is not passed to the function as far as Ida is concerned. So it contains an uninitialized variable, this var 644. So as far as Ida is concerned in this version of 
of the decompiled code. Var644, the address is loaded into EDX, nothing happens with it. Then the uh, contents of that variable are loaded into EDX. EDX tests that variable, and then they make a jump based on the contents of the variable. It's uninitialized, right? As far as Ida is concerned in this view. So what does that mean? Well, if it's uninitialized, it's set to null, or Ida could assume that it's that's a null byte, initialized null. So that would mean that this jump branch is true. And this jump branch jumps all the way down here to the next function in the decompiled view. You see what's happening here? Because that variable is uninitialized as far as Ida is concerned, all of this code in between this final call here, so all this stuff in green here, is unreachable. It's never going to be reached. That jump up here is always going to be true, right? Jump of zero, it's always going to be true. So there's no point in showing this other code in the decompiled view because it's not reachable. This is something that Ida is doing behind the scenes. They're optimizing the view of the decompiled code and removing dead code, dead branches, right? This is part of what they're doing to make this readable and easier to understand. So because that calling convention was messed up, it meant that they were unable to determine that this variable was potentially changed by this call. So then they assumed it was always null, and so this jump would always be taken. So this is why this is happening. This is why this occurs here. And what I can do is I can actually show you, there's this cool plugin that you can use to look at the microcode and various stages of optimization. Now, I could only get it to work in IDA 7.4, this is 7.5. So I'm gonna kill this, I'm gonna reload the binary in IDA 7.4, and I'm gonna show you in the plugin what I mean. Okay, so I've loaded this up in IDA 7.4. Here's our plugin, view microcode, and now we can view the uh, microcode. So this is basically a look at the actual intermediate representation of the binary as Ida sees it. This is their own internal microcode code structure. Looks a lot like assembly, but it has some characteristics that allow it to be manipulated as part of their decompiling process. What we have here is we have a bunch of different states of this intermediate language. So we have the generated state. So this is when they f do a first pass and they convert the assembly into their own version of this intermediate language. Then we have an optimized state. So they've run some optimization on it. I don't remember exactly what the uh, what they're optimizing here. Then we have a local optimization. So in the local op optimization, they're looking at the control flow, uh, trying to identify how that works. And so we can see here, the uh, code is getting pared down. Things are being removed from it that are extraneous. And it's looking a little bit more like decompiled code. So then they do the calls. So at this point, they have determined the calling convention for each function. So at this point, they would have determined incorrectly the calling convention for this function. Then after that, they do another optimization pass, taking into account the arguments and the calling conventions for each call. So after they do that, you can see that after this function, here you have a uh, go to 21 so there's no longer a conditional jump this conditional test of edx and jump zero is being replaced with a go to so they've optimized away that jump zero because they believe that this variable here is uninitialized and nothing is being used to it so you can see how that optimization works and if we go to the next optimization here they've actually completely removed all of the dead code or the code that they believe is dead. And they don't need the jump anymore because now there's only a few lines of code and it's linear. There's no conditional statements at all. So I know this is sort of a high level view and we're not getting into how the optimization works, but I think it's important to kind of look at how this works under the hood to understand why something as simple as a messed up calling convention could lead to missing, you know, tons and tons of code in the decompile view. Also, this is a good uh, reason why I always keep my pseudocode and my disassembly view side by side. It's a trick I picked up, you know, a year or two ago. And uh, ever since then, I've always used this because you can see uh, very quickly, you could see that, you know, all this code here is missing <laughs> from the decompile view. Whereas if you were just looking at the decompile view, uh, you might not necessarily know that right away. You would have been wondering, you know, why <laughs> is there nothing in this function? <laughs> why is it not really doing anything? Um, and it's because of course all this code is missing. So uh, hopefully that 
kind of clears up when you have a scenario like this, what to do. So first of all, identify the calling convention and fix them. You can do that by looking at the arguments that are passed to the function, uh, make sure that they align with the arguments that are being used in the function that's called. If the function is using registers that haven't been initialized in the function, well, you know they must be arguments that are passed to the function from the caller. So that should give you enough information to at least start looking at which calling types could be applicable. You can just try them. You can just keep changing the calling types. Just press Y here and you can, of course, change the calling type. So fast call and uh, it's actually going to be a void star. And we'll add that extra argument in on the edx register. So let's just do it a D word. Okay, and there you go. Uh, so as soon as you change the calling convention, Ida knows to fix up the function. Uh, they do a re-optimization pass of the intermediate language and they add back in that code that they removed because they thought it was dead. So if you wanna change the calling convention, that's all you have to do, just press Y. It's super easy, change the calling convention. You can try ones that don't, aren't correct and see what happens. Um, you know, you're not gonna break anything. You can always just change it back if you need to. And of course, if you click on the function, you enter into it, Ida will do its best to fix up the arguments and then fix the calling convention if it made a mistake, right? So each time you enter the function, Ida is gonna reanalyze it and try and update anything that it might have missed in the first place. So you can do that the fast way. Uh, you don't even have to know what the calling conventions are in most cases. At least now if you get stuck, you know what's going on under the hood and you can go in and fix it yourself. Also, I think that this is kind of a really interesting and easy entry into looking at microcode, how that works, and something that we'll probably talk about a little bit in the future. Uh, as I'm, like I said, I'm learning myself. It's something I'm very interested in. So probably have a few more videos on that. You might've also noticed that this binary is called warzone.bin. The reason why is because we will have a full reverse engineering tutorial looking at warzone. It is a rat and uh, we're gonna talk about how to extract the config from it, uh, analyze it. But in order to do that, you need to know how to do this first because it actually triggers this bug in Ida. So now that we know how to fix this calling convention for us, uh, stay tuned and in the next video, we'll be talking about how to actually reverse engineer Warzone. So with that, until next time, keep exposing the mechanics behind the malware. Stay curious. Yeah, you know you fucking feel me. Yeah, you know you fucking feel me. Yeah, you know you fucking feel me, right?